name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a real privilege to come as God's people in the presence of God, to study His Holy Word, to learn how to do a thing, and to unlearn the wrong ways in which we have been doing some of the spiritual disciplines and exercises of life. During these four days, I was led of the Lord to speak to you on how not to do a thing. Two days ago I spoke to you how not to pray. And yesterday I spoke to you how not to meditate the Bible. And today I am going to speak to you how not to give to God. And God willing, tomorrow evening I will speak to you how not to minister to the Lord. Now you may wonder why it's such a negative approach. What I told on the first day I want to repeat. If you carefully read the discourses and the sermons of the Lord Jesus Christ especially he was teaching very foundational fundamental doctrines for Christian life and ministry he actually began with telling how not to do it and then he went on to say how to do it for example in the Sermon on the Mount he spoke about prayer he spoke about fasting he spoke about almsgiving he said when you fast don't be like that when you pray don't do that when you give alms don't do that and then he went on to say how to do it because we in this system of this world which is sold out to sin and slavery and contaminated and corrupted by the evil thoughts of the evil one we have consciously or unconsciously picked up things which are not spiritual or scriptural and because that has been done always so we thought that is the truth and we never realized until we come to an exposure like this by an expository teaching of God's word that what we have been doing has been wrong. So usually when we approach a subject like this from a negative viewpoint it might sound critical but as I told you on the first day honestly with my conscience bearing witness and with the Holy Spirit being my witness I don't want to be critical but I believe in being analytical because all that can be shaken must be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken alone can remain this is an important premise and background with which I develop my talk how not to pray was the subject on the first day along with praying there is another revival which I call a revival of giving there was a time when I remember in my village where I come from Sunday morning you see around 7, 7.30 young boys and girls running here and there all across the street you know what they were trying to do they were trying to go from house to house to get some changes for the offering now that was a very very usual practice and not in a non-christian village but a Christian village like Nazareth where I come from in the southernmost part of Tamil Nadu Everybody will be busy to get some changes, but that is now changing. More and more of the truth of giving has been taught to God's people. And I really want to praise God for the revival of giving. It is not what it used to be a decade or two ago. But when there is a revival, there is always a danger. When God's spirit is very much at work, the devil also sows his tares. You know when there is a good rainfall, both the good grains and tares, they just grow fast. So usually during times of revival, as good things grow, the bad things also grow. Sometimes the bad things outgrow the good things. Weed sometimes outgrow the genuine grains. So in this revival of giving, there is so much of unscripturalness, mark my word, in this whole exercise of giving there is so much of unscripturalness that has crept in which we need to filter out tonight so in the course of this talk some of you might be offended though I don't intend to do that but if the truth offends you believe that the truth of God's word is working deeply in your life and be available to say I'm wrong and to give yourselves before God for a radical change 
unless our giving is proper and acceptable to God, our loss will be doubled. We lose our money here and we will lose our reward there. So this is a matter which we need to give a serious attention to. Just like I spoke yesterday and day before, today also, for uniformity's sake, and also because there are so many lessons I could call out from God's word, I'm going to give you 10 lessons on how not to give. I hope to cover this talk in about 75 to 90 minutes. If someone has to get back to the hostel or whatever, place before 9.30, free feel to get up and go without disturbing others. Otherwise, we'll try to finish everything by 9.30. And I want your cooperation by turning to the scripture passages. And if you have not brought your Bibles, get it shared from your neighbor. And those of you who want to take down notes, take down notes because these are important scripture texts which you will do well to refer to again and review and set your house in order. How not to give? Number one, do not separate life from giving. Do not separate life from giving. Because ministers and ministries are anxious to raise as much funds as possible for their programs, <coughs> excuse me, and for their projects, the givers are not sufficiently urged for holy living. Because when a preacher has got his mind packed up with ideas to raise as much money as possible in a potential gathering, he avoids everything that will offend people. Especially he would avoid everything that would offend the rich people. But if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry in the Gospels, he was very hard on rich people because he was not after money, money was after him. Now this makes all the difference. To today I have come with a prayer that the Lord will give me all boldness to preach the truth as it is. The Bible repeatedly teaches us that holy living and acceptable giving are inseparable. If you are not living holy, your giving will not be accepted by God. Even if you give a costly offering to God, Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, and verses 19 and 20. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on these people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. Then for what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba? You know, frankincense from Sheba is of a very high quality. What purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba? and sweet cane from a far country. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable and your sacrifices are not sweet to me. When a person does not live right, he is constantly tempted to bribe God. He is constantly tempted to appease God through offerings. A classic example we see in the life of the first king of Israel, in the person of Saul. God told him, to destroy Amalekites totally, completely, utterly, not to spare anything, even the king of King Haga. But this man destroyed all the worthless things, but he preserved things which were precious, oxen, materials, gold, all the good things he kept, but the unworthy things he threw away. And when Prophet Samuel confronted him, you know what he said? I have kept these things to offer unto God. And you know what was the instant and the immediate rebuke of that prophet? Mindless of the fact that he was talking to a great king? To obey is better than sacrifice. Say that again everybody. To obey is better than sacrifice. Do you think that God is more pleased with your offerings and all your sacrifices than heeding to the voice of the Lord? You have rejected the word of the Lord and God has rejected you from being a king. Brothers and sisters, 
the Lord Jesus Christ has given us a pattern as we read in Ephesians 5th chapter first five three verses the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself a sweet smelling offering unto God and I want to emphasize this important truth at the right outset God is interested in you than in yours let me repeat God is interested in you than in yours not only before God we need to set right but also before men our conscience should become clear the Lord Jesus Christ so categorically said in his great sermon on the mount when you come to the altar there if you remember that your brother has something against you not you having something against your brother mind you but your brother having something against you going one extra mile if your brother has something against you having come I don't want you to offer the gift leave the gift at the altar go your way first to get reconciled then come and offer the gift whether you are the offender or you are the offended you who come to offer unto God should take the initiative get right with God and get right with man do not separate living from giving the second lesson we have concerning how not to give do not by ungodly means do not earn by ungodly means we are living in a corrupt society quick money by any means is the order of the day that is the trend of the modern society but God's people must take a deliberate clear stand for all forms of corrupt illegal earning I'm going to give some examples all may not be applicable to every person but in order that as a teacher of God's word to give you the whole counsel of God I give you the examples of false earning if not in this country when you are here when you get back to your country or to your respective places of work or to some other assignment these truths I pray that the Holy Spirit will remind you so you will be careful to know all that comes into your money purse is sanctioned and sanctified by the Lord first thing you have to be careful about is false balance we read in book of Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1 that false balance and diverse ways are an abomination unto the Lord if you are in any business even though you may be a, just a shopkeeper do not cheat customers do not cheat clients say yes for yes and no for no nothing more and nothing less don't give a wrong impression about the product that you sell to any person you need to have a salesmanship but not at the cost of your Christian conscience our conscience is more important we cannot go by the convenience but we should go according to the conscience and according to our conviction secondly you need to take a firm stand against bribery if you turn with me in the book of Psalms chapter 26 verses 10 and 11 there is a passage which sometimes a casual reader might fail to notice he, here David speaks about the world their hands are full of sinister schemes their right hand is full of bribes but as for me this is what a Christian should sound and alarm the world is sold out to bribery and corruption but as for me most of you sitting here are Indians be careful recently I came across a very interesting statistics in a magazine called Outlook which has recently been launched in India and it has prepared what we call it's a new kind of word corruptometer so in that corruptometer the analyst has put various countries 
some at the top, some at the middle and some at the bottom. I as an Indian I was ashamed to know that my country is at the top. I don't say India, I say my country because I'm an Indian. So the spirit of corruption is more prevalent in India than in any other country. And because this is a congregation which is mostly made up of Indians, unless you take a stand like David, their hands are full of bribery, but as for me, I want to single out, I'm not ready to run with the devil's majority, I want to take a stand with God's minority. It may be a minority, but that will be a significant minority. When you are given to bribery, to give or take, that puts the poor and the underprivileged under a disadvantage and God will take you accountable for that. Thirdly, beware of getting into any partnership with corrupt men. You make the money here in this Gulf country and you are thinking about going home after five years or ten years to start a business. Beware of joining hands with a corrupt person or a corrupt partner. They would say, let us have a common purse. My son, don't listen to them. That is the admonition of the very first chapter of Book of Proverbs. Failing here, many people have seared their conscience and made a shipwreck of their faith. I want to tell you, your testimony is more important than your money. If you believe that, say Amen. amen. Our testimony is more important than money. And beware of delayed payment of wages. I want you to refer to these passages. When you get back home, I simply give the references. Deuteronomy 24th chapter, verses 14 and 15. It says, don't keep the wages of a person after the sun sets down. You have a lot of money for tomorrow, for day after tomorrow, for another five years, for another ten years, for your generation, for the next generation, and your grandchildren. But that laborer, he has set his heart upon that. That is very precious to him. Don't hold it on with any ulterior motive. I want you to turn with him in the book of James, a New Testament passage, which so emphatically preaches that Old Testament truth. James 5th chapter being a very practical episode. Look at the fourth verse. Indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. I was just wondering, why suddenly the writer of the epistle of James brings that name, the Lord of hosts, into picture? Any injustice we do to poor people, you know who will fight against us? Not just the sweet Lord, but the Lord of the armies, the Lord of hosts. Every time the Bible writers employ different, different names for the Lord, that means they want that particular truth to be focused and amplified there. If you cheat a man, the Lord of hosts will fight on his behalf because he is a God of the underprivileged and beware of questionable businesses lotteries liquor business someone said I'll buy a ticket if I get money one lakh I'll give it to God beware of such practices lotteries are not for Christians God has given us hands God has given us life God has given us education we must work and yearn and be satisfied with it. Beware of quick money. It will have wings and it will fly away. Where do you invest your savings? Have a check. And also you have to be aware of overwork. Overwork. To the extent there is no time for God or the family. We read in book of Proverbs chapter 23. 
verses 4 and 5. A truth which many parents these days fail to understand. Do not overwork to be rich. You see how words are so clear as if it is written for today. Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not for riches suddenly makes themselves wings and they fly away like an eagle towards heaven. God does not want you to work to such an extent that you don't have time for the meditation of his word and the ministry of his word. Limit your working hours to the extent you are able to give time sufficiently for God and his things. Thirdly, do not cheat the government. This may not be immediately relevant to you because you cannot cheat an Arabic government. But the most or the easiest thing in the world is to cheat Indian government. Therefore I am teaching you, do not cheat the government. See the Roman culture and the Hebrew customs differed very much from each other in their content and in their practice. But while Paul wrote to the saints in Rome, he emphasized that they should implicitly, unquestioningly obey all the civil authorities. Turn with me to the book of Romans, a passage which we can never afford to ignore or forget. That must be constantly kept before our minds. 13th chapter of Romans is actually a doctrinal epistle, but it tends to become very practical towards the end of it. He says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. There are four words which I have encircled here. Let every soul be subject. Every, no exception. No authority except from God. Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance. In other words, under no guise or under no excuse, we can ever disobey or cheat the civil government and the authorities. In the same way Peter wrote to those in Asia, in Bithynia, in Pontus, in Galatia, in Cappadocia. These were people who were in dispersion in all places over the world. And to them he wrote, Obey every ordinance of God in the form of government. How did Paul and Peter write these truths so emphatically in their epistles? I believe they learnt it from their master. One day someone came to the Lord Jesus. Actually they were people sent by these Pharisees along with Herodians. They wanted to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. They asked him a question. Master, we know you are a very faithful, bold teacher. You don't regard man. You preach the truth as it is. You don't worry about the consequences. We won't ask you one question. Is it lawful to pay taxes unto Caesar? And Jesus knew, knowing their heart pretty well, that they were trying to trap him. He asked them to bring a tax money. When they brought to him a tax coin, he asked them a question. Whose inscription and image are these? And they said, this is Caesar's. And my Lord Jesus Christ with all the spirit of wisdom and understanding and knowledge upon him. He said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Now this is a very important statement because he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. He did not say, give unto God what is God's and give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Now what is the truth we get there? Without paying taxes to the government, if you pay your tithe to God, that is not acceptable. A money that has to go to Caesar cannot go to Christ. Because if you have paid what has to go to Caesar to Christ, Caesar may not know that, but Christ knows it 
and the devil knows it as well and the devil will challenge Christ look here the offering plate or the offering box the money that has come here Christ this is not yours this belongs to Caesar and my Lord Jesus Christ will say it is there in this chapter record but it is not there in my record because my Lord Jesus Christ would never give up his standard of righteousness because his name is the Lord my righteousness Jehovah Tiskeno the Lord my righteousness he is a righteous Lord holy 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 is the Lord of hosts black money does not become white money just because you throw it into the offering box rather it becomes a wasted money don't bribe customs officials when you return to India don't give the passport to the customs officer with 200 300 dollars inside don't tell me brother Stanley how do you know that It is one thing to request the customs officer to be kind to you. It is one thing to speak to him for what purpose you take this material. There is something in the Bible called favor of men. Jesus Christ grew in favor with God and favor with men. So God can always grant favor with men in the eyes of men. But that cannot be bribed and earned. Please make the line very clear. Don't hide something and tell a lie to the customs officer and come out and meet your friends and say, Praise the Lord, God saved me. <laughs> now my question is, praise which Lord? That's the question. Do not cheat the government. Fourthly, do not make cheap offering do not make cheap offering when we give we must concentrate on whom we are investing or to whom we are giving only then we will give the best to God turn with me to the last book of the Old Testament even book of Malachi chapter 1 and verse 14 cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and makes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished for I am a great king says the Lord of hosts and if you look at the other passage especially verse 8 of the same chapter when you offer the blind as a sacrifice is it not evil offer it to your governor will he be pleased with you you see how God is asking what you are offering to me you offer it to a governor will he accept it your governor will not accept it have I become cheaper than your governor three months ago Queen Elizabeth came to India we have no obligation to give her anything any gifts but when she came down to India let her move into any industry especially Kanjiburam silk sari industry or any of such handicrafts wherever she went people showered gifts upon her she did not take the address of who gave what so that she would send a gift check from there why did they shower gifts upon her only one reason she is queen the same thing the Lord is speaking here how can you offer less than the best to me I am great king say the Lord so when you want to give to God don't have your mind on the size of the need have your mind on the size of your God I'm just correcting the attitudes of giving Abel gave the best of his flock whereas Cain gave some of his field produce 
That was the difference. David said, I will not offer anything to God which does not cost me anything. In other words, that which does not hurt me or cost me, I am not ready to offer unto God because he is a great king. He purchased from Arana the same place, the threshing floor. That was Moriah on which Abraham sacrificed his son. Later on, it was in the same place that God chose to build the temple through Solomon. What an honor. What an honor. No, no, you take it. You are king. You can take this floor. David said, nay. I must pay for it. I must sacrifice something so I can get it to burn the offering. And that was the place of the temple. I just thank God because my God never forgets the sacrifice that we do for him. He who sees you in secret shall honor you in public. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians, there you see a group of people. Eighth chapter of 2 Corinthians. The first three verses, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, not out of abundance, but out of poverty, deep poverty. They are abounded in the riches of liberality. They were poor people. No, 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 I am sorry. They were rich people. They were rich poor people. I want to ask you a question. Are you a rich poor man or a poor rich man? Are you a rich poor man or a poor rich man? That's for you to decide. These Macedonian believers, they are rich, poor people. I will tell you who is a poor rich man and who is a rich poor man. A rich poor man is one who gives according to his ability and beyond his ability. And I will tell you who is a poor rich man. A poor rich man is one who gives only tight to God. Poor man gives tithe. How can rich man also stop with tithe? It is not the amount, but it is the proportion that is important. You know mathematics? If poor people give tithe, rich people should give more than that. Because to whom much is given of him, much is required. Now you answer the question. Are you a poor rich man or a rich poor man? Do not make cheap offerings unto God. Give it liberally unto Him. Because I am great King, say the Lord. It's easy to lift up your hands. Oh Lord, I love you. Oh Lord, I praise you. Oh Lord, I worship you. Oh Lord, you are King of Kings, Lord of Lords, 360 names you can say. But until your purse is converted, you are not converted. <laughs> One young man, he was getting ready for baptism. The pastor took him inside water. The man said, wait a minute pastor, let me go out. Why? Just one minute. What's the matter? I have got the purse with me. I don't want that to be drenched. So I want to just leave it outside and come. And the pastor answered, your money purse also must be baptized. <laughs> Fifthly, do not yield to pressures. Do not yield to pressures. Christians are pressurized from all sides by appeals for funds from preachers and ministers. You must give out of your inner burden and not out of an external pressure. 
especially when you are going through troubled waters or you are in a critical situation beware of preachers who come upon you with pressures there was a woman she was a widow she was in her deathbed but she didn't have peace so she invited some preachers to pray for her these two preachers they realized that she is a very wealthy lady this is the real catch so they went to her and they asked so many things how much you have and what will you have she said i have so much wealth but i have not made a will and etc etc i want peace and the two preachers prescribed something for her peace you write a will of all your properties 50% for him and 50% for me then you will have peace which passes all understanding <laughs> and this lady because she knew she was dying and all she wanted deliberately was peace so she wrote it 50% to the preacher number 1 the other 50% to preacher number 2 and then the two preachers asked her now how do you feel to which she answered I feel as if I am crucified between two thieves. <laughs> Beware of pressurized appeals. Beware of sympathy appeals also. What are sympathy appeals? I am running into debts. Save me. Preacher's language. My family is in this problem. If you don't send me a check this week I will have to close down my air program Send money immediately Along with a prayer request send money Otherwise I will have to close down my air time I can't be in the air If you don't send me a special offering because the bills are accumulating I have an advice for you if a preacher is hanging in the air and he cannot continue there unless you pay you please drop him let him come to the earth <laughs> paul never made sympathy appeals to people turn with me to philippians 4th chapter look at verses 10 and 11 i rejoice in the lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again Though you surely did care but you lacked opportunity not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content We can present the need in a simple way without salesmanship Just say this is the program this is the project this is the need the lord leads you you pay stop there stop there that's what god is pleased with preachers must be able to tell us stop stop enough you have given so much don't yield to any kind of pressure there is so much of pressure in the religious circles in the cloak of religious language cheating honest and sincere christians world over so decide today Let him write any beautiful language. I am not bothered. Let him simply present the need. I will sing. I will pray. If it is a worthy cause, I will give, not otherwise. That's the way you will be pleased. That God is pleased with that kind of stewardship. Please do not support questionable ministers. Do not support. questionable ministers once upon a time the cine world was the most profitable business but a few years ago it was political world but now it is religion the most profitable business in the world today is religion how come that was predicted in the bible turn with me to first timothy 6 chapter and verse 5 first timothy chapter 
and verse 5. These are people who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Material minded preachers will use all opportunities whether it is print or pulpit to raise money. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are not the enemies of Christ. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Make the difference. Paul while writing to the Philippian church he said God is their belly. They mind earthly things. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They will use the name Christ but they don't go through the experience of the cross. Cross bearing, self denial, suffering, dying to self, learning to be without, these things will not find a place in their religious vocabulary. They will preach Christ. They are not the enemies of Christ, but they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And they also have no accountability whatsoever. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 chapter verses 20 and 21. We endeavor to do things which are pleasing not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. I have heard some preachers, you give them money, you know what they say, Brother, God bless you. I have deposited it in the bank of heaven. I want to know the address, please. Where is the bank of heaven? I know bank of India. I know bank of Mysore. I know state bank of India. But where is this bank of heaven? Later on only I came to realize from many such cases that is simply family funds. That's called bank of heaven. Because it is not accounted. The income expenditure statement is not given. I want to tell you something brothers and sisters. I am not against independent preachers. But I have a question. Why do independent preachers not publish income and expenditure statement audited in their magazines? I have a question. Whereas missions and Bible societies, organizations with sound social standing which is run and governed by men of honest report which is taken care of by collective leadership at the end of every financial year they say how much money they got how much money they spent and what was it spent for everything crystal clearly placed before the supporters why independent preachers don't do that this is a question which you should help me to find an answer for Because the Bible says, I do things which are honest, not only before God, but also before man. So when you give to someone, not this five rupees, ten rupees, but when you give large sums of money to people or preachers or organizations, make sure it goes to a ministry which has clear cut public accountability. Because in the name of religion, too much of corruption has become rampant in Christendom. The only way to stop it is that you need to check it. You may say, brother, I am not responsible for what that person does. I just gave. That's all. No. You know what Apostle John said? If someone comes to you with another doctrine, don't even greet him. If you greet him, you are partaker of his evil deeds. Understand? Even greeting makes you responsible for what he preaches. Let us get into the Bible, brothers and sisters. Too long we have been wandering in the wilderness. Now the time has come that we come into the Bible, biblical framework. Because the day will come 
When each man's work shall be tested by fire of what sort it is, not what size it is. The day shall declare it. If a man's work shall stand, he shall receive a reward. If it is burnt, he has to just escape as though through fire. Seventhly, do not give to influence preachers. Do not give to influence preachers. Trying to influence preachers through offerings is a sin against God. Philip went to Samaria to preach the gospel. Demons were cast out. People turned from their wicked ways and they were baptized listening to what Philip preached. When the news reached the apostles in Jerusalem, they sent Peter and John. When Peter and John came, they prayed for them and they received the Holy Spirit. There was a sorcerer who was watching this drama. His name was Simon. He came to the apostles and he said, Give me that power also. I am offering you some money. What was the instant answer of the apostles? Everybody turn with you to Acts of the Apostles 8 chapter. Because some of the words that the apostles used to rebuke Simon are far, far beyond our imagination. You know what they said? Verse 20 of Acts 8. Peter said to him, Your money perished with you. Underline the word perish. Damn your money. In the modern language, damn your money. Go to hell. And next he says, You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Verse 22 Repent therefore of this your wickedness. And verse 23 I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Look at the word. Strongest rebuke. Once again verse 23. I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Who? A man who said, take this money and then bless me. That's all he said. That's all he said. Take this money and give me that gift. Beware of preachers who promise special prayers for special offerings. No price tag should be attached to the grace of God. Jesus said, as you go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead and freely you have received what does it mean how can you sell healing how can you sell the cleansing of the lepers in your ministry you will say I will do this you do that so that is why Jesus Christ not in the 20th century I want to tell you the special prayers for special offerings it is not a 20th century invention it was there in the first century itself. No, I'm sorry. It was there even from time immemorial. That is why Jesus carefully said, You are going on a deliverance ministry. You are going on a healing ministry. You are going on an attractive ministry. You are going to raise the dead and cleanse the lepers and heal the sick and preach a powerful message. But be careful. Freely you have received. No price tag please. I want to take an example and I want you to study it when you get back home. Study the second chapter of Daniel and the fifth chapter of Daniel and see the difference between the two. In the second chapter of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel gifts after Daniel interpreted the dreams. There was no one else who could help the king interpret the dreams. So when Nebuchadnezzar saw this man interpreting the dream, he was very blessed by the interpretation and he gave him money. But in the fifth chapter of Daniel, Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, 
He had the handwriting on the wall. You know what he said? I will give you money, read the handwriting for me. To which our beloved Daniel said, give your gift to another person. I don't want that. I will tell you what the meaning of the handwriting is. What's the difference between the second chapter and the fifth chapter? In the second chapter, the man of God performed a ministry in gratitude, that man gave him a gift. But in the fifth chapter, the king tried to influence him through a gift. You see the difference? So in the first instant, Daniel accepted it. In the second instant, Daniel said, give it to somebody else. See how sensitive one has to be when it comes to the question of money connected to ministerial things. Do not give to influence preachers. Maybe you will think, okay, let him do whatever he wants. I just gave that money. But I tell you, your intention, God will judge you for. You are bound by inquiry and fastened with bitterness according to the word of God. Eighthly, do not neglect the poor. Do not neglect the poor. We normally think, you know, giving to God is superior to giving to the poor people. But when you closely study the Bible, it is the other way around. I want you to just recollect your biblical memory. The Lord Jesus Christ told the Pharisees and other people, you give tithe in even small grains, but the weightier matters of the law you forget. What are the weightier matters of the law? Love and justice. You give tithe, even of small grains. That is good. Tithing is good. But there is something which is weightier matter. What is that? Love and justice to the people. Open your hand and heart widely to the poor. And we read in the book of Deuteronomy 15th chapter. Turn with me to that classic passage. Deuteronomy 15th chapter, verses 7 and 8. Most of the scripture text I have given you this evening are key texts. So I would like you to read them again when you find time. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren, within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and you shall willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. I told you the other day in a small assembly which gathered here, every church, whenever it wants some money, will have an envelope like this. In that envelope, it will print a scripture text. You know what that scripture text is? God loves a cheerful king. <laughs> this is one verse which we have not forgot. God loves a cheerful people. I think wrong, nothing wrong in printing it, but I have a question. If you look at that passage where that verse is given, it has no reference for church funding. It has no reference for church projects. It has no reference for changing the church curtain. It has got no reference for any of these things. You know what reference it has got? It has got reference for raising money for the poor people. Amen! amen. You are not saying Amen because you don't know that. <laughs> Come on, open it. Second Corinthians. 9th chapter. Let us see the context in which it was given. 2nd Corinthians 9th chapter. We read, let each one, 7th verse, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And if you look at verse 1, now concerning the ministering to the saints, now concerning ministering to the saints. And if you look at the verses before, it again speaks about ministry to the poor saints. Now there was a famine. People were going through a very difficult time. For which Paul along with Titus and a few others was raising money. And in that context he said, God loves a cheerful giver. He who gives to the Lord 
Finish it. He who gives to the Lord, I'm sorry, he who gives to the poor, lends unto the Lord. And what he has given, he shall give it back to him. Lord, I will give 50% of what I have to the poor. And my Lord said, Today, salvation has come to this house. 50% to the poor. Today, salvation has come to the house. Not only that, my Lord Jesus said, He is also a son of Abraham. Why also a son of Abraham? There was a rich man. There was a poor man. The rich man died and he went down. The poor man died and he went up. You know the story. And where did that poor man ultimately go? He went to the bosom of Abraham. What was the sin of that rich man? Did he sleep with another man's wife? Did he steal somebody's property? Did he murder somebody? Not at all. The only sin of that rich man was he did not build a small outer house for Lazarus. Number one. Number two, he did not treat the wounds of Lazarus. And number three, when his dogs came to fight for the food, the bed crumbs that fell from the table with Lazarus, the rich man did not chase his dog. Enough, isn't it, to go to hell? No outer house was built. The wound was not uh, bandaged. And when dogs came to lick, the rich man should have chained. I am sure he had some chain for the dogs. He should have chained his dogs. He didn't chase them. The greatest unpleasant surprise the man had, he landed up in hell. Even after going there, you know the Jewish pride is not an ordinary thing. A Jew remembers he is a Jew whether you put him in China or Japan or America, everywhere he is a Jew. You put him in hell, he will still feel I am a Jew. Not only that, from hell he is lifting up his head and there he sees Abraham and you know what he says? My father Abraham. <laughs> hey, if Abraham is your father, why the hell you are in hell? Even hellfire was not able to snatch the Jewish pride from his fiber. And Abraham, very kind gentleman, he knew that this fellow was already disappointed. He didn't want to disappoint him any further and hurt him anymore. So he said, my son, from hell the fellow calls my father. From heaven comes the answer, my son, but no transfer. What was that? Such a big sin. The poor was not taken care of. You don't need to go to Calcutta to help the poor. You don't need to go to Bombay to help the poor. There are Lazaruses all around our, our corner, our doorstep, your neighbor. Let not religion rob you of helping the poor. Let not religion rob you of your justice and love for those who are mistreated. Jesus said, when you arrange a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends, don't call your relatives, and don't call those people who will again invite you. But invite the poor and the maimed and the unfortunate because they cannot repay you but God will reward you. You want repayment or reward? If you are repaid here, you will not be rewarded there. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, a young man came to him, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, obey the commandments. Which commandments? Don't murder, don't cheat, don't bear false witness, 
honor your father or mother, etc., etc., and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young fellow said, all these things I have obeyed from my childhood. What do I still lack? Good question. And Jesus said, sell what you have, deposit it in the bank. No, no, no. Sell what you have, not deposit it, but distribute it to the poor, then follow. You will have treasures in heaven. Oh, I didn't expect this answer. He went away sorrowfully. Jesus looked at that man with all sympathy. Jesus felt for that man. These are all gospel narratives. Jesus felt for that young man. A young man who was who had such a religious bring up, a young man who was so good in obeying the commandments of God, a young man who was so anxious to enter into the kingdom of God. He was not an uneducated idiot, but he was an educated advocate. Such a person. <laughs> and he came to me asking a straight question, what I should do to eternal life. And I told him to sell what he has and give it to the poor. He weighed it in a balance. Eternal life on one time and his riches on another. He chose the wrong side. And he went aside. Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Is it wrong to have riches? No. Then what is wrong? It is wrong to be attached to riches. I have gone through the Old Testament several times when I was studying several themes in the Bible. And one thing that has always fascinated me is this. God is called the God of the poor. Everybody say that. God of the poor. That's a beautiful name given to God. Ninthly, do not publicize your giving. Do not publicize your giving. You see, writing the donor's name on the chair, on the table, on the ceiling fan is a very common practice. And nowadays they write the donor's name in the tube light also. The light is also blocked. <laughs> and some preachers, they go on stuff for the big, bigger project. They say, you give this much money, I will put your name on, on, on that, on that uh, wall of that particular room. You pay so much money in that room, I will put your name. Such kind of pressures are against the Bible because the Bible says when you give, let not your other hand know that you are giving. What happened to that, brothers and sisters? Why from did you get the doctrine that you give money and I'll put your name on the doorpost? Which Bible are you following? How dare you cheat God's people? And how bad that God's people are so easily cheated. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. That was the cry of the prophet of the old. That is my cry tonight. God's people are destroyed, not because of lack of devotion, but because of lack of discretion. In Tamil we say, Bhakti undu putti My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Ananias and Sapphira, they came. What did they want? They wanted to impress everyone that they have given and all to God. They were struck by death punishment. About a year ago, a friend came driving his almost new Tata mobile. You know, Tata mobile is an expensive luxury car in India. He drove it all the way to Velu. He chose a time when I was not there to come and he left the book and the car key and the car with my friends. He said, ask Brother Stanley to use it very carefully, he needs such a vehicle. 
Then I said, did you take a photograph of that man? Said, we tried, but he refused. So I got his address. I had meetings in his hometown. I went there and I tried to somehow catch him. The man escaped and he went to another town. Because he didn't want me to meet him and say, thank you, brother. Here I see a practical religion. Here I see a practical religion. So whatever you give to God, try to hide it as much as possible. So that God who sees you in secret shall reward you openly. Because my Bible says, God is not unrighteous to forget whatever you have done to him. The painting will be forgotten. The next fellow when he paints, he may by mistake to just paint it out. But my God shall never ever forget the good things that you have done to him. So when you give money, maybe not in a cover, but with the cash. I want to tell you a simple example. Putting it into the offering box is as good as or even better than giving it in the hands of the preacher. But what do we do? No, no, this I will not put in the box. I want to give it to the preacher's hands so the preacher will know how much I have given. Let not the preacher know. If the preacher knows, he will unconsciously and unnecessarily, because of his human weakness, will come under an obligation. Don't trap preachers like that. Give God and God will reward you. I know I am teaching a very, very tough subject. But it needs to be that way only. Tenthly and lastly, do not give just to receive. Do not give just to receive. God is no man's debtor, but we must remember certain important truths when we give to God. In the old covenant, when you give something, then you are blessed physically, materially, financially. But in the New Testament, when you give to God, God may bless you financially, but what is guaranteed is not material, physical or financial blessing, but what is guaranteed is spiritual blessing. This shift one has to understand when we move from old dispensation to the new dispensation. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 9 chapter and 10 to verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the soya and bread for food and supply and multiply the seed you have sown, increase the fruits of your righteousness, spiritual blessings. That is why Jesus said, great will be your reward in heaven. Sell and give to have treasures in heaven. Yearn friends with the money of this world so that when you die they may receive you in the eternal homes. So you see everything ultimate. Don't give with the short sightedness of an immediate profit or benefit. But think about the ultimate blessing. We are Christians who should live with the heaven's ultimate outlook. There is one truth I always remember and I tell my brothers and sisters wherever I go concerning giving. It is more blessed to give than to... So what is the blessing of giving? Giving is a blessing. Amen! Amen. Giving is a blessing. What is the blessing of giving? Giving is a... Because Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Mary, she had the alabaster box. When she emptied it, she did not expect anything in return. She emptied it because she knew on whom she was pouring it. And you know what Jesus said? She did what she could. And she has done it beforehand for my burial. You know what happened? After she, Jesus died, some women took all this perfume and went to see the body of Jesus to anoint it. 
they were too late. Jesus got up and went out. Why? A woman has already anointed him. What you want to do for God, do it now. Tomorrow may be too late. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, benediction. We thank you this evening for the privilege that you have given us to give unto you out of what you have given unto us. The whole earth belongs to you. There is nothing which we can really give you. Everything we have is what you have given us. But Lord, help us to remember that you are great King. Thank you for the corrective lessons that we received tonight. We pray, O Lord, that our very life will be a sweet-smelling offering before you. And help us to always remember, it is better to give, and it is more blessed to give, than to receive. Thank you, O God, for your unspeakable gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.